I am joined by Nimco Ali, who, um, alongside Bill Browder, perhaps, of all the people that we've done on Unfiltered thus far, is perhaps furthest from being a household name. Um, that's, I mean, partly because you have dedicated yourself almost exclusively to one area of, of campaigning. You are, for my money, the country's most prominent campaigner against... It's an acronym FGM, but I think it's important for us to say it in full. We're talking about female genital mutilation, which is undertaken mostly for cultural reasons in mostly African countries. So um, thank you, Nimco, okay. for joining us. We'll, we'll start, uh, I think, with you rather than with the campaign because um, one leads inexorably into the other. You, you, you were seven years old when you left your native Somaliland in, in circumstances that are pretty horrific. Yeah, um, well, I was seven when I officially kind of found myself stateless um, after having FGM itself as well. Um, and I would just like kind of say the fact that it's not an African and it's not a cultural thing. It's a form of violence against women and girls. And because of the fact that it was um, for years put, put into the kind of context of culture, we kind of didn't really deal with it. So, yeah, so I was on holiday um, in what is now Somaliland when I was um, seven and the civil war all the all the persecution of the north it's essentially that's why it kind of broke away started and on the way back to the uk for some weird reason i think my pet like my mother and my grandmother thought that i was never going to come back to somaliland i was never going to come back and know my culture and fgm was something that just had to happen um and i came back to the uk very british and very somali at the same time very confused how long had you lived here when did you arrive um, four in... so oh, was, at the age so of four this was after of... your grandfather was um so no basically so what happened was that my mother and my father lived between the uk dubai and somaliland so every time every summer that's why i was really close with my grandparents and my paternal side of the family is that we'd we'd go back and i was raised to speak my language to kind of understand that i came from a good family in africa and this is where i was from but i was also privileged enough to live in other places across the world. So we were in, in the UK on our Somali passport. We weren't um, taking citizenship here. Okay. And then what happened was that when our, when the country essentially fell, then the passport fell. So you kind of find yourself... So it state, ceased to be a, it ceased a, to, an it ceased international to, yeah, document. Yeah, it ceased to exist. So similar to what's happening in Syria at the moment, is yes. that there's some kind of prosai government. Not to, not to make light of it, but like... Um like Tom Hanks in that film, stuck yeah. at the airport. It, it literally was stuck <laughs> at the airport, but we were um, stuck in Djibouti. Right. Um, and, and the UK government, like, you know, were quite, like, you know, lovely in the sense that, like, you know, this is where my second home was. So we um, ended up getting papers to come back, uh, but we had to claim asylum as soon as we got here. But I came back um, a completely changed um, person. I'd, like, you know, witnessed war. I'd seen death. I thought my grandfather had been executed because, like, you know, the dictator was very good with these comms and telling and telling us that your, the, your grandfather was a was a prominent he was a prominent backer of the independence for Somaliland so um basically we so my mother was on holiday and I always I always have this conversation with with people that I can you know are kind of confused about my political background mm. and the way that we'll, I am. We'll, we'll, we'll get on to that yeah we'll with who I am who like you know the way that I am and it's the fact that I grew up a very privileged yes. um I always say that my um brightness comes from that the first bed I ever slept with was a gold cot was it really it was, yeah. So your family were, were I there mean, were, there were, aristocracy, so there, to speak. Yeah, so. They were, they were um, quite wealthy and they were very prominent. And my grandfather owned a lot of hotels in what was the Mogadishu, which is the capital of Somalia okay. um, right now. And as he saw the persecution getting, like, you know, tighter and tighter. What he, would one be persecuted for um, in, that, in so, that era? So the whole history. So Siad Bar. Yes, yeah, but so yeah. the whole context is that Somalia and Somali, um, so the northern part of Somalia and the southern part of Somalia um, weren't necessarily as a country until right. 1961. So they, um, so the northern part um, was a British protectorate, and the south was um, like you know Italian, like you know held by the Italians, and then there was like the native Djibouti who, who are also Somalis, who were like you know just held by the French. And then in 19, um, and then in 1980, sorry, 19 in the 1960s, um, they came to. Together. But then what happened was that the South took more and more of the power and then the North were like, well, this is meant to be a unionship of brotherhood, so why are you not giving us more? And then as, as more the North complained, then the kind of the dictator took like, you know, a tighter reign on these people that were kind of uprising. So my 
grandfather left his business, so he was essentially kind of kicked out of the South and came back home. And he started to fund the Revolutionary Army in um, northern um, Somalia, which essentially were young people that were writing poetry and, like, you know, just, like, you know, writing songs about dictatorship and looking for freedom. And he was arrested for that. And I was um, six years old when they came in and dragged them out of the house. Can you remember it? I, I remember vividly. This will sound like an odd question, but are you sure you remember what actually happened rather than the family descriptions? Yeah, that? because because what was really interesting, because I always used to, I, I remember things when I, from, from when I was, like, three and okay. four. And my mother always says, like, you know, how can you remember those things? And I went back in 2016 for the first time yes. in um, to the place that we left. And I kept on, so I said something to my um, great aunt about, um, like, you know, being in this corner, like, really scared, because there were bombs that were dropping. And she literally was, she couldn't believe that I remembered everything, but it was quite vivid. And as a six and a seven-year-old, it really shapes you that, um, like, you know, there's bombs falling from the sky. And I remember my grandmother, I, like, I don't necessarily know if it makes any sense, but if, if there ever was a war right now, I would go to the corner of the room and, she, and, and her kind of, theory was that if there was a bomb that hit, then the corners of the house would always stand. Yeah. yeah. Probably I structurally sound, structurally sound, so, architecturally valid. Exactly. Bomb avoidance but, technique. Yeah, that was her That was her way of trying to um, keep us safe. So uh, we would go to, like, the, the corners of the room, and I went back to that same house, um, like, you know, 27 years on, and looking at it was, like, really interesting because I remember, like, you know, how scared and how freaked out I was to be in that corner. Uh, so then we ended up leaving... So so, um, and I remember all of it. So then what happened was that there was my mother um, had was out of the country. So she was like traveling with my father. Because you were quite a jet setting. Yeah. So she. Type of family. But, so you were back at base while they were off. Yeah, traveling. She was yeah. traveling with my father. She was basically, he's like, you know, candy. So you were staying with your grandparents. So we were staying with our grandparents. When, so they, we when the soldiers with, literally dragged my, the door down. Yeah, and dragged my grandfather out of, the, um, out of the house. And then what happened was then they came back the next day and took all the passports and took all the gold and everything else. And then my grandmother, um, I think a lot of the women started to like, you know, realise. And what was interesting is that a lot of the older boys um, were, were all in boarding school. So my uncle was in boarding school in Canada. The others, like, the others were here in the UK. So there weren't necessarily as many um, like older sons of these men who, who were being um, kind of dragged out. Mm. So, so the dictator really wanted to kind of like, you know, get the lion and the cubs but they were quite young. So a lot of the, like, you know, so my two uncles that were at home were both about, like, nine and 12. So they weren't as old as um, my, my, my older uncles who were at boarding school and everything else. So my grandmother um, decided that we were going to leave. But then they said, but you can't really leave because everybody's going to know who you are. So um, we decided that we were going to be smuggled out of the, the capital, Hedgesa, and go to Djibouti, which where we had um, family. And I still... Um, have family and I had so there was me my sister and my brother and we were the only kind of English speaking kids and my brother who um, tries to become like well, he's an adult now he's like he's got kids and everything else but I can never take him seriously but <laughs> what happened was that um, so my mother um, had known that the city was under attack so I was coming back in so she was being smuggled back into the country so these to were to try of, to get you yeah to try to, to try to get us and this is the kind of thing about do you remember things or were they told to you so my mother was mm. coming back into the country and my and me and my family, my grandmother were all um, trying to leave the country. And then my brother said that he needed he needed to go to the toilet in English. And then I said something in English, saying, "Well, well, you can't just yes. like shut up." And then my mother heard us, and then she started shouting. And then I said to my grandmother, "I can hear my mum." And she said, "No, you're just dreaming because like you know this is just like there was just chaos, mm. people leaving the country and everything else." So we ended up leaving the capital city, and my mother went in as it was being shelled to try to find us. And about three and a half weeks later, we all found each other in Djibouti. So that was the context of how uh, my life towards, towards the end of being six was. And then I turned seven as we were waiting for our um, papers to come back to the UK. And then I have FGM, which made no sense to me. Do you know what was going on? I know that you've, 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 you've told this story a few times, but most people watching or listening to this won't have, won't have heard it or indeed anything similar ever. Yeah. So... I mean, we'll go into some detail about what it involves because I think I think you have to you have to stare it yeah in the face in the face to understand what it really is. But but the age that you were is almost unbelievable. Well, um, globally, the average age is five. So I was a little bit older than what the average age is. And I think had I do you remember that day? Do you remember that morning? Do you remember? Yeah. I mean, how, how did it all? 
I rem- unfold. And I think this is one of the kind of interesting things and why I ended up, like, my activism mm. was always quite different to everybody else's because mine happened completely out of context right. in, in the sense that I wasn't, I had actually had no idea I was a girl. So we, I, we have, a like, you know, constant conversations these days about gender. Yes. And I had no idea I was a girl until that happened because I'd seen my, like, you know, uncles and yes. seen people be circumcised or boys yes. be somewhat, like, you know, have something happened to their anatomy or come back from having something to anatomy. But I never kind of felt that sense of um, fear and the sense of kind of confusion. And I think the aura in, in the room kind of changes. There wasn't a similar aura when my uncles were having their circumcision or when, um, ironically, somebody else was having their tonsils out or whatever something physical was happening to kids. There wasn't that uncomfortability of but the... But you, you sensed... Uh, I sensed it. And wh- it. Why would that be if, if, the, if they accepted view is that this is both normal and a good thing to do. Because because within my family it wasn't, but I actually hadn't realised that my mother and my grandmother never necessarily had the power to do anything, but they worked in... Had it been done to them? Yeah, it had been done to them. So so within my family it was 100% until my niece and my little cousins were born, and now we've kind of changed that conversation. But when it when it was happening, so there there was a conversation being had about something happening and something, and and I had no idea what, what, what it was, and there was arrangements being being made. So we, we need to do this thing with Nimco, and you're aware that it's you that they're talking about, but you're not aware what this thing is. No, it was more of the fact that like something's going to happen. So on that day, this yes. lady's going to come. Okay, but and it so, could have been anything. Yeah, it could have been anything. So, and 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 like you know the the idea the fact that I've just seen civil war and yes. I'm trying to get out of this country I just had no idea what it was so maybe it was somebody take having my picture taken because you're six, seven yeah. years old so you're just picking up all these kind of um, yeah weird and um, weird things and then it was um, and I remember one of my best friends like when I told the story for, for the first time um, having a really massive issue with me because. Um, People have started to wear the burqa, but when I was growing up, the only people that wore the burqa were people that didn't actually have the um, assets to be buying different clothes, and because sh- it was very materialistic so at that time. It was a sartorial choice, rather it was, than yeah, a cultural. Yeah, one. it was. There was nothing to do with religion. It was just the fact okay. that because they were jumping poor. ahead again, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna rain. Oh, you sorry. Back. sorry. <laughs> but no, but it was just like so for me. It was because um, for you, everything's linked, isn't it? It all is. All of the different strands of your life come together in all, all in this, various different ways, which explain the. The weight and the and the profundity of your activism, but I want to try and impose a okay. chronology on yeah, you yeah, if yeah, I can. Right. It's not that. So you know, but so there, so there I was. It was just this. Um, if I tell you like how the day yes. happened was that yes. my mother. So this woman came to the door, and I knew there was something going on. So there was like commotion. So they were, like you know. So we always have this thing that um, if if we're kind of praying for something or if we're looking for a blessing or whatever, it's like a, a massive meal is making. Like you right. know, so there's like there's like um, sacrifice of like two goats and all this kind of like really um, very African um, mm. Somali um, stuff that happens. And that was happening. So it was an occasion. It was an occasion, but it, like I had no idea what the occasion was. And I just assumed that we were just like praying for safety to get back to the UK. And that's what I was essentially um, praying for. And I don't actually even know how I knew she was a cutter. Or I don't even know the fact that, but I was just kind of startled. So basically she came to the door. The, this is, that, is that the word that's used? A cutter, yeah. But, but even by people who haven't got a the, um, no, problem so, with it. No. Everyone calls it, does yeah, she have status? Ca- yeah, does everybody, she have yeah. status in society? Yeah, she, yeah. so it? everybody everybody calls them cutters or okay. like a circumciser. Or, Is it like, the same person that does men and women? No. no. So like, men are done by men. Yeah, men are done women by men done and by mostly women. it's like, you know, by done by um, yes. women. So there's this, um, and I remember it was, so, so, um, so for me it's really bizarre. It's like we went from like, you know, bombs dropping to all of a sudden being in Djibouti in a massive villa where there was like a, a like, you know, a courtyard when you came into the door. So you kind of come out of the living room and there was a massive courtyard and then the front door was there. So my grandmother was going to open the door and then, so I ran like, you know, just to see who this person was because I was really excited thinking. It's an then, occasion. It's a it break. Could be a party, could, it could be anything. It was, and the fact that maybe another person had made it out of Hedegesa and were here, right. so yes. maybe my uncles were here or whatever it was. So I went to, um, I went to the door and I just saw this woman and she was just like dressed in black, and she had this little kind of um, case that was wrapped in like a dirty kind of napkin. And I don't know what was said, but I just didn't like her. and I just didn't like what was going to happen. And I remember my mum then coming and then asking me to go and get changed or to go, like, you know, to go have a shower. And I thought, you know what, I'm not really keen on this. So I just went out the back door. And and that's what I used to do when I was in Manchester. It's like, if I didn't like anything, like it. I would just, like, be pissed off and try to pretend I'm, like, you know, I've, I've run away. And I yeah. would always run away to the garden and sure. just, like, sit in the treehouse. 
So that's what my thing was like, I'm just going to go to my auntie's. So my auntie had li- um, was living down the road and my cousin who... Um, who was also on on holiday from boarding school, was there as well. And I just said to him, like, you know, there's this really weird woman that's there and I don't really want to see her. And then my mother had followed me and I had no idea that that, that she'd followed me. And she's like, I can't believe that you were going to tell your cousin about this. And I was like, what do you mean about this? I don't even know what was going on. So it was... and So for me, I think the things that I kind of black out is, like, I don't know how I got from being... Um, near my auntie's house to be beneath this woman. And what was really interesting was the fact that how she scolded me for being a, um, like, you know, a privileged little brat. Why, why would your mother not want your cousin to know what was happening? Because he was a boy. But so boys don't know about this boys or? don't like it's it's <clears throat> it's like one of the most open like you know non-discussed conversations like everybody knows everybody has FGM but nobody really knows about the ins and outs of um, it and you okay. assume but because you assume everybody knows then you don't have the direct conversation with somebody so it becomes a sort of constant unexplored presence like a rosemary's baby kind of thing where yes. it's just like this like mysterious thing that happens but nobody really talks about it but you know it's kind of weird and we should talk about it and the employment of the phrase which of course for most westerners the first exposure we've had to female genital mutilation would have been under the euphemism female circumcision yeah. so that plays into what you're describing the boys think somehow without going into too much that you have a penis biographic or, 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 you know, genital yeah. detail. They're just thinking, oh, it's no different from... To what happened to me, and therefore, why is it... Big just a female version of the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So Let's not talk about yeah, it. Yeah, so that's the whole point. And also, I don't really but, like... But, but I ask the question because it involves... It implies a sense of shame on the part of your mother rather than secrecy. Yeah, yeah no, it Even is, though... But there is a lot of... Because there is a lot of... And and, and that is the thing, was, was the fact that because I've been so open, people were shocked that I wasn't embarrassed about what happened to me. Yes. As opposed to me, because I was... I yes. was I so because I was never in even when it happened it's like it was painful it was horrible but I was never embarrassed by it I was um so so which which creates a, a slightly easier atmosphere for me to ask my next question before we talk about um what the woman did yeah um what exactly does it involve um so there's like four like you know um major types where so there's they and they get more invasive as they go along so the three most um common forms of FGM is like a clitoridectomy so they just remove the hood or partially or part of the clitoris um, with a razor with a razor with scissors with with anything that can really cut and um as we go on that like you know FGM is becoming more and more medicalized and is it's it? happening within medical settings cuz we've We've spent a long time looking at um, trying to reduce harm as opposed to, like, you know, looking at the humanity oh, really? and the rights of women. So if you must do it, do it in a way that minimises the harm you'll do to the Exactly, child. or to the or, or to the person as they become women and they right. have children and everything oh, yeah, else. Yes, of course. So, um, so that's that one. And then, and, and then type two is the removal of the clitoris and um, the external labias. So I'm not sure how, how familiar you are with the female anatomy, but um, women's, like, you know... Like, like you know, we haven't got images right now, but yeah. So it's like basically, it's like taking the lips out. So you have they have these like external um, and again with a razor or with scissors a razor or, or scissors. And then type three, um, which is the one that's most common, and it's the one that I had was the fact that it was removing the clit, like partially removing the clitoris, the external labias, and then pulling everything together and stitching it up. So and then and then um, what, 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 why Nimco? What what is? I mean, I appreciate you've dedicated most of your adult life to campaigning against it, but for those of us who come to this with abject ignorance, um, but obviously empathy, well, what is the reasoning behind there is no, it? There is no reason in a part. But there must have been, when it began, somebody no, when, must have... When it bega- and I think it was began, it was just like, I think it was like some really, like, you know, angry and disgusting men that decided that if they were going to keep the chastity of their women, then this is what they were going to do to it. And what so, I, so that becomes, I didn't know this, but it, I, I understood the removal of the clitoris as a way of diminishing or de- de- denying sexual pleasure, which yeah. would, of course, render the woman even more of a chattel to her man. And if, if she doesn't enjoy sex, then she's not going to cheat on him and therefore his patriarchal position becomes yeah. and enforced. Becomes but, pleasure, but, the, but the stitching you've described, that is a form of ensuring that this, Purity. this child yeah. cannot grow into a woman who will have sex with anybody yeah. until a man decides 
And then they remove the stitching, do they, so at they marriage? Or? So, yeah, so what the whole cam talks is that they're, they're, meant to re- um, they're meant to remove those um, stitches or de-infibulate you. So that's, like, you know, the legal definition of, like, you know, type 3 is infibulation. Yes. And then they de So I don't want to, um, because one of the things that I do all the time is that a lot of people want to talk about FGM in a very yes. soft way. And I'm well, like, we're not doing soft. that today. Yeah. We're it's not going to do that today. It's it's tempting a, though it is, because obviously this is, uh, I'm disturbed. And you're right, it's like you, and you have the right to be disturbed. And I think I want people to be disturbed, and I want people to be angry enough to say that I really want this to stop. Because um, one of the really interesting things is that people always say to me, "Oh, we don't want to be judgmental." You're jumping I was like, ahead again. Oh no, no, no! no. I'm just I'm talking in general right. about the issue of FGM. People say in the context of like we don't want to be judgmental, and I'm like, actually, you should be judgmental. There, there is no balance. To there this is no debate. balance. There, you don't invite on someone now. We have now. Thank you very much, Nim Kowali. And here is someone. Here's a cutter yeah. to tell us why it's all wonderful and everything. No, you're right. This is, a, I guess, what, what people talk about as the downside of cultural sensitivity. Yeah. When multiculturalism becomes a bad word. Exactly. It is when people say, well, no, that's that's their tradition. Yeah, that's yeah, their yeah. culture. And that's, that's perhaps a trap I fell into at the beginning of the interview. Who are we to sit in judgment? Yeah, it would yeah. be like them telling us off for Morris dancing. Oh, it, exactly. But it's so, so it's one of those things where um, I am kind of jumping. But it, it is, and that was, and that's and that's what happened to me was that and I had you, the most, that is the most severe form. Invasive form, because I never I want to say I can't um, quite I still can't quite I never want it. to say I never want to say um so like, cut is the wrong word it's cut and stitched but that's like that's like type three that's I, the I most, appreciate yeah that. but in terms of that's why it mutilation happens, yeah and it it's like, so basically you. the cutting is the act and I hate people that say female genital cutting because cutting is the act mutilation is the consequences yes, that of course. um you are legally and like you know physically um left with so that's what happened to me when I was. Um, so it's coercive seven. control of women. I mean, it, it is. This is an African slant on it. No, no. So it's a cultural slant and a global patriarchal slant on right. it. Because I, because like, as much as it's like you know, um, there's a focus on Africa. There are people within like Russia, Pakistan, um, India, and um, even in the Americas, in p- places really? that. Yeah. So. And not I, always Islamic either. No, there no, are plenty no, of other faces. Always, you always like well. wherever you find. And I think what the really interesting thing is that if you find FGM as more than four. So the thing about Africa is that in places in in the, in the 28 countries where it's common in Africa, it's because what do we mean by common? It's more it mean more than 40 percent of the population. So in my hometown, or in 40 percent of the female population. Yeah, obviously, yeah. it's like you know. Um, but um, in my in my um, native Somaliland and Somalia, it's at 98 percent. So 98 percent of women um, under the, um, over the age of 14 have undergone female genital mutilation, and when it's <laughs> When it's that when it's that much of a norm, it becomes less of um, a sinister thing and more of something that of people just don't know the difference. So they just kind of carry on. And you, as the person that comes in to say something different, becomes the person who's actually coming in to really um, and break something. But I like so I'm a very somewhat British child, like well travelled, and this this thing happens to me. And I get scolded by the cutter for. Well, let's like, go back to that if we can. I, mean, yeah. I know you're comfortable, well, not comfortable is the wrong word, but you're you're prepared to talk yeah. in some detail. So you're now back in your home, or back in the house where you were yeah. staying. The cutter is, you're in the room. The first thing you can remember is her being on top of you? No, her just like looking over me. So And, I, and you're naked now? Yeah. So um, you don't remember getting undressed or anything? No, I wasn't naked. Or? I was in these. Um, I was in this kind of like this house dress, which okay, is just, um, it can just be lifted up. Yeah, it just be lifted up, which is genitals. which is weird because I ended up um, buying one recently, and my my, my, my niece who is going to be exactly the same age as I was when I was cut, in about ten days is really weird she loves them and it sure. used to really irritate me that that she loved them like and then like flashback I, almost yeah kind of thinking like why are you like you know in love with these things but they are really comfortable it's what it's it's what the adults wear and she wanted to just be in like an adult and it's your association you're reacting to not her exactly so i've kind of tried to um like you know let her have one and i um bought one from her and for myself recently and wore it to an event and i thought it's about actually reclaiming yes. that it's this like so i was wearing this kind of very um it's like a nighty it was like a 90 but just made out of cotton and then I went then I went back so then I, I don't remember anything until um, I, I woke up like the next so like, would you have been anaesthetised or I think I might have probably or yes. either passed out from the shock or it I was could just be, tired it could be clock, it could yeah, be a form or, of, I could have yeah. done any, so then I wake up and it's like you know I'm just staring at the ceiling and I was just like I was I was 
I wasn't in pain. I was just angry. Right. And I think that's what, like, you know, over the last, like, you know, 18 months, I, you know, I've, I've grown out of that anger. And I, and I remember, like, a lot of the activism that I've done and kind of um, it was a lot of anger involved in that. So I was just Did like... Did you know what had happened at this stage? No, I, d I, d I didn't have so any... So you were angry at the I was just angry. violation, the I was fact just, that yeah, something I was, had happened? That... Yeah, and I, was just, and, I, and I was just actually really just... I was just like, I was just really sick of being scared. I thought, you know what? There was bombs dropping and now this happened, like, literally just like... I Until about 2014, I was just like, fuck Africa. I just want to get home. I just mm. want to... I just want to leave. But you're still seven. Yeah. You've woken up. You're furious. You probably would struggle to put into words why, yeah. like a lot of furious seven-year-olds, yeah. but the grounds for your fury are almost unbelievably sound. When, yeah. when did you begin to piece together what had gone on? I didn't know, I didn't. So I came back and um, came back to the UK and I, I was really like, you know, excited to have the same year two teacher I had in year three because I'd kind of, so I went directly after. So this is back to Manchester, so back so to primary Manchester. school where you've been in there since year one. Yeah. So you had a relatively normal double life as it were you're just a Ex kid in a school in manchester yeah. who um in a very kind of uh, in a very um jewish area of manchester okay. and what was and i think that comes back to the whole thing about the male circumcision and like you know cultural celebrations um and what, what yes. so, so so what really happened was that and not questioning the way things have always been done yes. as well that is part of that or also looking for something <clears throat> to kind of give context to what this so i came back as this like yes. very open seven year old and i was very graphic so i went to my teacher and i said she's so she knew that like she'd seen the news that there was a war in Somalia yes. and she's like how are you I'm so glad you're okay I like you know you're welcome back and then I and she said how was it like you know and I think she was expecting me to talk about the war and mm. this and I just thought I was very explicit about the FGM because as you are as, ch as a child yes. you just wanted some context so I really for me I think for like 15 years of my life it was searching for context yes. to what happened and I didn't have a narrative for what FGM was and um, so I, so I, so I said to her like, you know, this thing happened. This woman, like, you know, dragged me. I was like, you know, held down. I was cut. Like, you know, basically, like, you know, what was it like expecting her as the as the keeper of all knowledge to have the answer? And she said to me, oh, well, it's a bit like a bar mitzvah, but that's what happens to girls like you. And I thought, like, I, I don't, I don't. Well, she was right and horribly wrong. Yeah, and try, and and I think now trying to be um like she was an adult that didn't have the words to say like i, th I think she was trying so i'm trying to be like you know i'm, I'm trying to make a sense of, of, of the, a lot of the adults that let me down growing up and i so i think she was just trying to be um as polite what would you like possible. her to have done I would have just said to her, oh, my God, I'm so sorry, and just, like, sat down with me because I didn't have any answers and she didn't have any answers. And I think it's the ability of um, adults to say, I don't know, and to go search for something else, but in that moment make me feel safe. And This is it's, it's like an uncrackable nut, isn't it? Because presumably previous generations went through similar to what you went through. Everyone's going to react to this mm. trauma differently. But the only people that could help you cope with the trauma would be people who'd been through it. And people who've been through it have dedicated their lives to persuading themselves that they haven't been traumatized. Exactly. So I was, for the first time, I was living in a parallel world where um, like 100% of one of my world had been cut yes. and 100% of the other hadn't. Yes. And I was straddling both. Do you feel anger towards this teacher now? No, I Did just you before I, for years. Or? I, no, I didn't. I didn't feel. I didn't feel. I like you know. I think it was. It was. It was. It was. It was the first time that I was dismissed as being like not being British, not being Somali, and not girls being like anything. You. When she said girls like you, because which I, she meant no malice by. I don't think she did, and I and I think she meant like you know. I don't know what she meant actually. Do you know, I can't really like you know. Because boy, boys like him have their foreskins cut off. Yeah. Girls like you have their vaginas. And she said like you know, this happens. And you told her you'd been sewn up. You told yeah. her. Yeah. I didn't know. I, I, I didn't know that time I'd, I'd, right. I'd, I'd been sewn up. But this I is, didn't... of course, relevant to, to to the sexual organ. Yeah, at, yeah, yeah. at that point in your life, you, you've used that part of your body to, to, to go to the toilet. Yeah. That was literally that nothing was else, and that yeah. was all yeah. unaffected relatively. Well, well, no. So then, so then the second, so that that happened, and then she said, "This is what happens to yeah. um, girls like you." And I thought, like, what does that even mean? And then we ended up moving from Manchester to Cardiff because my. Um, Grandfather had um, like you know been rescued. I heard it then. Yeah. When you said the word Cardiff. I heard the accent. Yeah, Cardiff comes. Out, yeah, yeah. So I, did, I went to a good school, but it comes out sometimes. So I went to um, I went to Cardiff, and I think there's like this, like how my grandfather kind of came came to being is kind of interesting in that in that sense. But I went to so I went to Cardiff, and then um, how old were you now, Nimka? Um, so I was about nine. Okay. 
So, so nothing, I mean, you've just been getting on with your life. Yeah, just got on with my life and just... Not knowing the full scale of what had happened to you. Yeah. Knowing that it hadn't happened to everybody, but it happened to girls like you. Yeah, and then, but then also being take like, you know, it was kind of overtaken by the, by the fact that most of my family were either displaced or, yes. like, you know, dead, or we were trying to find some of my, like, you know, so my grandmother who didn't have any nationality outside of her being Somali, like being right. Somali, we're trying to bring her over here. So, like, you know, and I, like, you know, I, like, you know, by de facto became, like, the second parent with my mum, yes. who was um, twenty um, nine at the time when I so she's like she um, had basically never worked being a kept woman like mm. it was like it was quite. What had happened to your dad at this point? So my dad is my dad is really interesting in in in, in the sense that he wanted my mother to come back to Dubai. He he didn't want her to settle in the UK because he didn't want his like you know kids growing up mm. like you know full time there. And my mother was like, well, my family's all over the country, like all over the world, and this is the only place I can give us um, asylum. Yes, the interesting thing about like you know Saudi and all these places is that you can come live there if you have money but they won't take you in right so my mom was like well no it's like you know I need to, like you know I need to reconnect my family I've got sisters and brothers that are that are back so home. your your branch of the family had money yeah. but if she wanted to maintain contact with family members that didn't so, so, basically, to... so basically my grandfather so my dad's money was in Dubai so his money wasn't like as affected as my grandfather's which was all still in Africa and being seized okay. so we literally had nothing in that sense okay. but apart, apart from like you know that the money that my yes. father that my father um, um, had but then he wanted us to come back to Dubai and my mother had had also bought over two of her brothers so my uncles be, like you know were, so we all came over, we all came because there's two families yeah there's the paternal and the maternal maternal family yeah your, your mother was Focusing on her, her family, yeah. So my grandfather was now we thought was executed, so he right. was gone. Her dad. Um, yeah, her dad. Um, um, so my grandmother was stuck there with my two aunties. My other uncle, um, his school in um, Canada kicked them out because my grandfather wasn't paying the tuition fees anymore. So she was like, "What do we do with a kid that's like you know in Canada?" Um, so you and your siblings could have gone to. Dubai, but but all the other members of your mum's family couldn't. Yeah. So she stayed. In and also, if we and also if we if we'd gone, so we, so no, we're still in Manchester. But um, if we'd yeah. st if we'd gone to um, Dubai, then she couldn't bring her family over. So yeah. it was the whole point okay. of uh, actually it's... like there's no point just saving ourselves. So if... you are, you up sticks head to card. If the family is in relative turmoil, but yeah. uh, but I mean progress is made progress is made because my, my my grandfather so my grandmother had come to join us so and she decided that there was there's there's a large um somaliland community in, in cardiff it kind of yeah it dates back over 200 years yeah, yeah. so there's like the seaport so east um oh, east sure, london sailors. yeah so east london um sheffield and cardiff have the largest like somali populations that have been um coming in and out for like the last like you know 200 years right um so, so we went to Cardiff and I just got on. Went to a, a like you know a lovely Catholic school um, and like you know really love singing, pray, like you know going to the church and just like enjoying um, all this stuff. And then just before um, my just before I left year six, I like you know I was like in severe pain like one day and and the, and the teacher I was going to the toilet, but at the same time. Because I was like, I went from like a seven-year-old to who, who used to just go to the toilet mm. to knowing something had happened. I wasn't really conscious the fact that I wasn't passing urine as I had as done I, before. Because yeah, yes, of course, you, you it's just don't. About, you comparisons, just, isn't it? It's, yeah, you it's just all don't. Relative. Yeah, you just don't have the kind of context for that. And then um, basically, I collapsed. And I was rushed into hospital. And this is the kind of thing, this is like the second stage of where um, first it was a teacher who I, like, you know, told openly what yes. had happened to me. And then um, at 11, I get wheeled into a major hospital in Cardiff with basically a sewn up vagina. This is like an 11 year old sewn up vagina. Um, and I, so I get, I, my, my, my kidneys were going to fail. And had it been like, you know, a week or two weeks after, I would have been dead. But like you know, I didn't necessarily. I don't think. But does that mean that the cutter did something wrong? No, it was just because the fact that obviously, like, it's not natural for your anatomy to be sealed. No. So um, I ended up getting a kid, like you know, getting a urinary infection, and that kind of kind of gone on into my kidneys, yes, okay. and like you know, like because you, know, you didn't know that what you were feeling was abnormal. Yeah. You thought it was. So and you like you know kind of put that yeah. kind of context. So and then I, I think this. I think the second person who really um shocked me was I was I was expecting this teacher um this um nurse or these doctors to say something and nobody said anything and I thought like why are you like used like you know I know that like you know this is a result of what happened to me and I know it's not normal I've kind of like you know picked that up 
like you know in kind of some kind of subtext that it's not normal and you you know that I almost died because of this kidney so they were very open about telling me that I almost who was with you was your mum with you in all? yeah my mum was with me so, and again I mean how does she behave in these situations she was concerned and she was really sorry and she was and she was guilty really, she was yeah she's I think she I think she's been immensely guilty for a long time and okay. because she was 27 when I had this and it's like as a 27 year old I you know I've started to do activism that was hard but as a 27 year old go going against a social construction yes. of what women should be is um, I think what's what's shocking also is the fact that it's driven by women from what I mean I know it begins with with a male impulse. But, but I think I think women are... There are no men involved in the story you've told us today. There are, there are no men involved, but men hold the power. Of course, and, and, and the it's, expectations. And the expectations and, and the stories that they tell about, like, you know, the perfect woman, the perfect mother, the one right. of the whole point of the fact that, well, if you don't do it and take care of this, then you don't, like, you know, you don't trust us to do it. And if we do it, then we might... So there's, there's yeah. like, a lot of coercion in, 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 in the sense why... Um, of course. Why women do that. And I... And for me, it was um, we can kind of come back to this. Like when I first, when I met when I met a cutter for the first time about about three like about three and a half weeks ago, it was it was really um, not three and a half months ago yeah. um, um, over the summer. It was really really interesting because like um, I went um, I went back to Somaliland with um, Ragi Omar, and it was interesting. Even him, he is a Somali man, like you know from Somaliland. Most of his like you know everybody mm. has had FGM, but he just never really saw it as like you know as powerful or as like you know close as it was. And it was and it was the same conversation that ironically that I had with Obama when he was like trying to make out FGM as this like really weird like you know distant thing. Yes. And I said, well, your father came out of a woman who was cut, and like you know, had your um, had you had your father been a woman, like you know, the, the like you know, the president of the United States could have been born to a woman who had FGM. So FGM is not like you know as historical or as far fetched as we think in our like in a modern no, day clearly. life. So it's. Um, and I think that's I think that was the whole kind of way that I've kind of really realized the power that um in 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 not giving women like you know access to education or access that's to the reading. way that you can perpetuate this sort of yeah sort so of behavior so we're back in the hospital I don't know why I keep asking about your mum maybe I'm being unfair the nurse you feel this time let you down or, or at least yeah. you expected a medical professional to I wanted, press an alarm button, almost oh no, metaphorically speaking. Or, or, yeah, exactly. Or just at least just like asking me to say, I'm, like, and asking me. I think the whole thing was like nobody was asking me if I was okay, and I, and that is what all I wanted to say. Like you know, the fact that um, are you okay? And I remember this nurse like, and it was, and I, ironically, it was similar to being cut again because I was like on my back in pain, and I was angry, and I was looking up at a bloody ceiling. But then this time, this like this like you know. Mm. Um, ginger nurse was like looking over me with a stupid grin and I just thought to myself like why are you grinning I just had no idea why she was like trying to give Nervous me this like tension. I, I think it was her fake sense of reassurance with the right. teacher had said like yeah. you know this is what happens to girls like you I just looked at her and thought like why are you grinning like I don't like I don't get it and that was so I think so at the age of 11 I um, officially kind of checked out of um, being like Somali being trying to find anybody that really understood this um and what was quite nice was the fact that I I I um, I'd got into a different school to a lot of the other girls and everything else I'd stopped going to like you know religious classes I've stopped going to like you know I could go to the church at my school if I wanted to So you were being, you, you were raised as a Christian I was yeah I was no no I was um, raised as a Muslim educated as a Catholic Okay it was quite strange, but, okay. I, but but I quite liked it because it gave me this sense of I understood both religions as being great insulator from extremism as well, and from, and from the idea of like one, um, one view, one world. View. Yeah, and understanding that actually both of these people are lying to each other. So I think that's why. Um, and that's why I'm not angry at pe like you know at pro FGM women because they're lying to themselves to make themselves feel better. And it's the you 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 reinvent yourself, then, yeah. or you restart your life at secondary school. You've glossed over what happened in hospital. Do you, do you, did your um, right look? You speak very frankly, so I yeah. would as well. W yeah. What did they do to your vagina when you were they in opened, hospital? They opened it up, and it was just like. It was like I was I was deinfibulated is the legal term. And that would ordinarily have happened when? Um, just before I got married. As part of the as process part, of ceremony, yeah. the ceremonial process, we're as going like, to yeah. unstitch her vagina. Yeah, to now be like I don't know, like 
deflowered. I don't know what it was. It's just, it's really ridiculous. And it's like when you, so that's why I'm very candid about it in the yeah. fact that I tell it straight because it's just so stupid. And that's one of the things about FGM, it's just ridiculous. Do we know when you broke down the three types of FGM for us, do we know how the percentages break down? How yeah. commonplace is your experience, which is by far the most severe? Yeah, so basically, um, it's like in Somalia and, Somalia, and that region of, of, of the horn type three, which is the most invasive, is the most common. Right. And that's the same in um, Egypt and everywhere else. And I think a lot of people always like are quite confused about, because like Egypt has one of the highest prevalence ratings in the world. It's like 91%. And around 70 of that now is being done in hospitals because people want to make it safer. Sudan is in the 90s. You've got... Um, Indonesia and Malaysia are close to 100%. So on a global level, there's about 200 million women who've been who've undergone FGM. And um, in a UK context, it's about 130,000 women that are here. And from all manner of backgrounds. From all manner of backgrounds. And um, so by type 3, the most invasive form of FGM is very common, like, you know, where I'm from yes. and but for me so at the age of 11 I really got like a new lease of life where right. and the, and I think that's where like you know that's where my mother and I actually started off because beyond like at that moment I was um I went to a very um free mixing school um I was able to I, I was like you know, I never wore the headscarf I was never chastised for being a girl so I was very free like you know I wasn't I was um I decided at 13 I wasn't going to go to Arabic class anymore mm. and my mother never like you know said you had to so you like you know I remember the first Saturday that I said I didn't want to go and she said oh, that's fine um I think the first Saturday I said I was unwell and she said, oh, that's fine. And then and then another Saturday came and I just said, I just don't want to go because there was a lot of, um, I, I, I had a lot of conflating issues with a lot of, of, the, with, with a lot of the girls that were there because I was, I was very open and challenging things. Like I, I knew all of them had FGM and that's the thing growing up in Cardiff specifically, every single girl that I knew had FGM. It and it a, would always have been done overseas. No, it was either... So what, what happened was that a lot of them girls were getting done in Dubai or some were co go, going to London. There was girls getting done in Manchester. You go to a private clinic. So, yeah, there was a private clinic. There was a, there was a Sudanese doctor who um, was actually doing this stuff. And what had happened was that because a lot of us had either grown up in the UK or were born in the UK, um, a lot of the parents started to um, freak out thinking that none of these girls have been cut and they're going to be judged for not being Somali enough. And I think it was it was it was it was the weirdest thing like some of them were like 15 16 year old girls and i like at that moment i was judging them as an 11 year old saying right. like you know you guys can actually say no yes. i was a kid i was seven but they're still but i didn't actually understand that they did to have the a family voice structure, yeah. Enthralled yeah, they, to the history that... yeah and so the idea of them saying no was just like and it was so my primary school was it was in a lovely area, but at the same time, we had a large po po population of Pakistanis and um, Bengali girls, and then we had like Somali girls were the second. So those were the three oh, yeah. um, BME communities. And my Pakistani friends would talk about getting married when they were 14. And I was thinking, why would you get married when you're 14? It's like, you don't have to. Mm. And um, a lot of those people have kind of added me on Facebook now and seeing them um, were like 16, 17 year old girls, and we're 34. It's really weird. And the teachers knew about it. The MPs knew about it. It was this whole thing of, oh, we can't really, like, you know, interrupt that conversation because we don't it's necessarily... It's not our business. It's it's not this, our I mean, this is the toxicity of when leftism, multiculturalism yeah. is used as a, as a bad word. Or, yeah, usually left-wing people yeah. who say, what right have we got? It's a sort of post-imperial hangover. that so, says, what right have we got to tell these people how they ought to tell girls like you how your communities should yeah. behave. Or even support you. So it has to come from within, it has which to, is why people like you are so important. So when did the activism... Um, so I did, so I went so I ended up just like going like you know finding um, books as my kind of self like my savior. Why so, do you think? Why why did? Because I mean, as you say, one hundred and thirty thousand girls in this country alone, yeah. millions across the planet. Why why did you take against it so violently? Why why didn't you just? sort of fall into place and Cause it was, why and I think it was why you what no because it was one it was stupid and two <laughs> I, lots of stupid things happen no, and it's no more stupid for you than it is for the other but, 120, 120 but I think and also I think the massive role that my mother played is that she never said it was okay she just said nothing 
And in her saying nothing, I was actually thinking, you are the woman that gives me everything that I want and you answer all my questions. You won't so go why, can't, so why can't you answer this? So, I, so in her not say, not saying anything... Did or you not try being, to talk to her I did, about it? I did. And she I think, would just shut, shut she down? Says, she said nothing. And I, and I think I kind of... Um, I, like, you know, I apologised to her, like, a few, like, you know, a few or years four. ago. Because the fact that I didn't... I, like, I have been able to kind of go on a journey. So in her not being able to say anything. So my mother, the teacher and the nurse, none of them actually actually had the vocabulary to really express yes. this. And you so, have recognised that you can't hold them responsible no. for that because they're victims of circumstance in the same way that... that I, so I ended up finding um, Noelle Adasalawi as, um, as a 12-year-old and she wrote this book called The Hidden Phases of Eve and she writes about FGM in that. And it's really interesting because she writes about... And that's where the Rosemary's Baby kind of context came in. I don't know why, because I had, like, two older uncles that were, like, my brothers. Yes. Um, so I ended up watching movies that I shouldn't. Um, Rosemary's Baby and Boys in the Hood were two films I watched very young that I was that, that were very inappropriate for me to be watching as a thirteen year old. But seminal. Yeah, but they kind of made that um, made that. So I remember reading her book, um, hidden, the bit when she writes about um, FGM, and she, but she, but 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 but, um, but Noelle's mother is very complicit and very right. active in her cutting, so she holds her down. Right. And then she comes to light and like you know tries to look for her mother, and then she sees that her mother was part of this. And then in that she decides that as a child I don't have the ability to survive, so I'm just going to stay within this context. But I know that this is not something that I believe in. And this is something that's wrong. And she was the first person um, that really kind of resonated. How did you with, find her? Um, just in the library. Just like. But what was, were you looking at in the just, library? What just, section? Just like anything. Just like novels. It was just like books, and just like I just. So you I, stumbled on it. You were yeah. looking for something with a what? A, no, I was just looking for a book that I hadn't read. God. I was just because I just constantly would be because I was in this parallel universe as I, as I kept yeah, saying. It's a like, duality that yeah, you describe, and then you just had to find something that kind of like you know that really. Um, yeah, it spoke to you. It's the extreme version of the child from a very repressive religious background keeping a separate outfit in the phone box. To change it? into, oh yeah, like the girls used to kind of, yeah. But it's a very, very extreme and internalised version of that. There's two yous. No, there was, yeah, there, no, there wasn't, there was, I always used to say. Um, and this is, now we're moving towards they're becoming one you. It's no, there was there was always like you know my my history teacher. I think so it was Mr. Star, my, my my history teacher, and he was also my form teacher at the beginning, who I was really um, kind of passionate about history. Um, and I and and he used to say to me like you know plan an IMCO population one, because I would always have this like really weird way of seeing yes. things. And um and my and then I remember him calling in my mother when I I think it was my second year just like second term of year seven, and he said she's really gifted but she sees things black and white. Right. And I'm really concerned about that. And then my mother was like, she's she doing well? Is she gonna get her GCSEs? And I was like four years to the like yeah. when I was gonna get these GCSEs. <laughs> and he said, yeah, she's really really smart. But she, like he said, I'm really like you know I'm really um I'm I'm really concerned about like you know how grown up she is and how she's really just like you know because very, you're trying to process really complex. Exactly. Stuff at a very early age. And just to kind of do that. Well, maybe that's the answer to my question. Other girls didn't try to process it. They just accepted, accepted it and got it on just... with it, with the, with the, with the, you know, the reduced life. And I was a complete asshole to them because I was just always constantly thinking, like, why are you guys not asking questions? What did they say to you? Nothing. They just, they just, yeah. Literally, I just didn't oh, have... Shut up, name code. Yeah. Like, well, why do you have to be different? Yeah, Everyone else has gone along with it. Exactly. Why, is it that right? Yeah, it was like, you think you're smarter, you think you're different. And I still get that from a certain kind of context of when I um, ask the awkward questions. Or... So you'd get a liberated, an ostensibly liberated woman living in the West, but, but hailing from one of the countries that you've mentioned... And they would still see you now, someone from your own peer yeah. group, your own age group, they would still see you now as a troublemaker. Um, actually, it's changed in the last, like, you know, six to seven months. Has it? Yeah. Because because it's receiving more publicity yes, than ever and before. Also, and also, weirdly enough, so when... Um, but no one's going to turn around and say, I'm really glad that they cut off my clitoris and sewed up my vagina. Shut yeah, oh, up. Oh, God, yeah, you would. Yeah, so I was on I was on, um, I was was on on Hard Talk um, once. And CNN. No, no, it's um, BBC World. Oh, okay, BBC yeah, the World. BBC uh, World, yes. Um, so, and 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 they bought somebody to counter oh, my God bless FGM. The BBC. So, nice. um, a pro FGM woman, and it was really weird because I wanted to hug and punch her at the same time. Yeah. Because I thought I said, "This is what happens is when it's 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 when you internalize something. It's like women. Have you ever? I don't know. Well, I do this a lot. When you see like you know a guy being really aggressive to a woman in the street, and you try to step in, and then she yeah. turns on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, always. It's that kind of thing of the fact that actually I'm really embarrassed by this because I was never, I was so 
open about it and I was always having these kind of conversations so yeah so this woman talks about how um, and she had it done um, at 21 and if you listen to the conversation she also takes her younger sister with her so the way that she was doing it was was the coercion to get her younger sister to um, kind of come along so she's she thinks it makes her look beautiful she thinks it's heightened her sexual pleasure and um She's pro FGM, and I sit there and I'm just thinking. And she doesn't want to call it FGM; she calls it female genital cutting, and it's um, akin to male circumcision. And it's like you know um, a heightened power and sexuality for women. And I sit there and I and I, and like you know, obviously um, the guy who whatever his name is, the tall one from the BBC, was like being very academic in this conversation. Yes. I'm like, you can't actually be academic. And he was talking about the context of. Um, Choice, and I said that choice doesn't happen in a vacuum, and you can't like nobody. I said, how do you know? Had women crawled out of a cave today and said, I want to have my labia like you know sliced chopped off, off. Sliced off? That I could believe there's some free choice in that. But if yeah. you're created and raised in a society where you're told you're disgusting or all these other kind of things, you can't. There is like there, I don't think there's the ability to really freely have choice, and that's why I think legislation is key to say in the fact that, do you know what, actually you can't do anything to your anatomy. We're, we're going we're gonna to have to squeeze the um, adult NIMCO into, into a very small amount of time because yeah. I just glanced at the time and, and I've lost about half an hour in this okay. interview just listening to you. you know, you've taken me so far into your story that I lost track of time. I now know why you do what you do. I know what happened to you. I had no idea about the detail of what happened to you and what happens to hundreds of thousands of Women and girls, millions. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of Britain. Okay. Initially, and then and then onwards. Um, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine a bigger mission than the one that you've set for yourself. I, it started off with like one. I, I always say it's like one girl, one generation, and it yeah. started with the birth of my niece. I think God like. This like, is you know, this is the daughter of a brother or a yeah no sister. my brother my brother so um, the guy who I didn't take seriously but I have to know sure. because he's an actual grown up um, <laughs> so no so I I rem so it was it was weird that how old were you when your niece was born um, I, I was to work yeah, I was twenty four yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so she, it, it was, it was. And you hadn't been an activist up until that point. You've been getting on with your studies, no. getting on with your life with this scar, both physical and mental. Yeah, I kind of, I, I, I defaulted in the sense of becoming an. So what happened was that I'd gone to Bristol, got a law degree, was like really like in a happy. Mm. I was like pretending I was happy. I was just kind of just, I, I'd, I'd kind of actually started to embrace this Nimco who was always just like living on this like very kind of. Yeah very academic like just like this is I'm just going to be great at everything and I was and I, and I and I think that's like you know that kind of was like self-harming in that sense of just like always gonna like be great at everything and um I got into the fast stream and I, I went into public health um and there I was working on communal diseases and this I went to a feminist society um thing and this um, woman came up to me she said oh my god are you Somali and I always get this it's mm. like are you Somali? And I said, yes. She said, oh, I didn't, like, we take you for, for a Somali. And I thought, like, what does that mean? And then she said, oh, I've got, like, a, 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 um, I have a large cohort of Somali girls in my um, school. Would you come talk to them about aspiration? Nothing, like, to do with FGM. And this was, like, 2006. Yes. Um, aspiration. I said, like, yeah, fine. Go ahead. Like, why not? It's like, cool. Come into the and I remember walking in, and I remember always being conscious of the back of my head. I thought, don't be don't be a stuck-up Nimco. Because everybody thinks I'm a stuck-up Nimco. When I'm not, I'm just, this is who I am. I'm I'm self-deprecating. I take the piss. Sure. It's just like... But, but I think the more you think about stuff, the more right perhaps you have it, to an opinion. Yeah. It's just, so, but I thought, you know <laughs> I what? Said, remember, this is my job. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I just think to myself, okay, do you know what? Actually, don't be an arsehole yeah, when yeah, you go yeah. into this Very room. important. Yeah. In, so a, in a voice. In a, so... Went in and I was like to these kids like, hi girls, like yeah. what do you want to be when you grow up? And they all just looked at me like, like fuck off. I was like, oh, who are you? Yeah, yeah. Right, grandma. Uh, yeah, and, then, <laughs> but do, and, and 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 I was really intimidated um, by them. Yes, they're to, terrifying. Teenage, I, yeah. teenagers in general, teenage girls in particular, yeah. absolutely and had, terrifying. And, and and I hadn't been to an inner city school or whatever, and that's not the kind of school that I went to. So um, and then we were talking. I was like, and then I said, oh, I, I, I um, am I work in public health? Like, you know, do you want to talk about ovaries and mm. all these things? And and then the teacher left the room and these were like all 14 like Somali girls and I knew them and I, and I knew of them mm. I used to see them around um, and then one of them just like miss and I said oh don't call me miss I'm like 21 it's like come on guys like and she's like uh, Mrs. FGM Halal and she put it in Islamic context 
And I said the most flippant thing. So the reason why I do what I do is because of the guilt of that moment. Oh. And I essentially, and I said to her, like, oh, I basically was like, what do you guys know about FGM? Like, how many have you, how many of you have even been cut or know somebody that's been cut? And I spoke to them as we used to speak when we were in school of the fact that everybody had been cut. But I'm thinking, like, 14 years on, like, none of these girls have been cut. Like, what the hell is like? It's 2006. We're in Bristol. And there were 14 girls, and, and 13 of them had FGM. And I was like, oh. And then I thought, you know what? Don't be that teacher. Don't be that person. Keep a keep a face and, okay. and, and like, pretend like you. And I was like, and then I remember the girl who was like, the, and they all oh. kind of regressed to being like, um, like seven year olds themselves. And the girl that hadn't been cut was so shocked. And I thought, my gosh, she doesn't they'd know. They never had conversations. Yeah. About and I it. thought, even with each other. So the 13 wouldn't have known that they. The other ones had been. And I thought, oh, God. And I said, you know what, guys? It's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. And then one of the girls that really, like, you know, like loud one, ballsy. just, yeah, ballsy one, snapped out of it. And she said, you know what? Don't think you're special. To the to the end um, um, to the girl that was at the end. She's like, don't don't I don't, I don't, and don't, and don't think you're special. I know they're gonna take you this summer. And she was very graphic about what happened to her. She's like, this is what's gonna happen to you. And I was like, fuck. Like, and I was like, then I was like, don't cry. Was my main thing. It was like, just don't cry. And um and and then the teacher walked back into the class and everything just kind of just changed. It was just as though they'd kind of just gone into like it was Superman take, taking off his thing. Just the like, duality. Again, yeah, they just kind of flipped two, over. Two and then the teacher asked him like, "Are you okay?" And what I was happened? like, and I thought, like, then I just left the classroom. So then we just carried on with the lesson and I left. And then I remember going to my office. I was just like breaking down. Yeah. And. I'd never said anything about me me, me having FGM to anybody because I thought after 11, I thought this is nothing to do with me. And um, I just went to the public, like I went to the, ch the child protection team and I said, you have to like do something about this and talked about FGM. And I talked about FGM in a third person and talked about the issues and stuff. And then I left to come to do some counterterrorism stuff in London, which was like unrelated to um, FGM. So I came to London and I thought I'd left some great policies and everything else was working there, but I still felt really guilty. Mm. And I started to volunteer at this charity that works specifically on the issue, not saying anything about me as an adult that's had FGM. And I started to, um, like, you know, mentor this girl who had just come out of being sectioned because she had the same form of FGM that I had. And when she was 19, she was rejected by a boy that she was in love with because um, he had this kind of, like, um, vision that she was never going to be able to enjoy sex and he'd lived in a hypersexual country. And and I always just say to her, like, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be okay without putting it in that kind of um, context of who I was as an adult yeah. had been through that. And then she said to me, "Oh, I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to do a, um, a, like you know, a play. I'm going to do some artwork about my therapy. Would you come?" And I thought, "Yeah, that's cool." And I took this guy, this white guy, who, was, <laughs> who we were like on a, um, a second meeting, because um, I know this is going to go out and people and people are going to judge me for hanging out with white people. But um, I took him, and I remember just like this girl was late for the event, and everybody was more interested in her being late rather than if she was okay. Yeah. And she went onto the stage and she just started to hyperventilate. Oh, and I thought to myself, you know what? Your silence is so complicit. Like everybody- you mean everyone else in the like room. Every, like, and everybody else thinks that this girl is never gonna be beyond FGM. Like she thinks- That's that all her, she's like, ever gonna be. That's all she's ever gonna be. Her life is over. And I don't know why and how I did it, but I just went onto the stage and I took her aside and I said to her, I swear to God, it's gonna be okay. I, like everything's gonna be fine, and then she asked me like, the, um, and then and then um, she said like, how do you know? And I said I had the same, F I had the same thing, and then that friend of mine was like behind me and had no idea, and I still remember his face, and he was like, like you know, drinking a diet coke, going, and I thought God, I've got to deal with you as well later, and that's when I thought like you know that was about 2010, and my brother had just told me that he was about to have a daughter, and I thought. Do you know what? A new government has come in. Um, I never really wanted to be in civil service. I wanted to be a lawyer and I gave that up. Um, maybe I'll just do some activism for um, six, seven months yeah. and I like, you know, talk to this on this specific, on this specific issue, issue and just change the conversation because so people can think that it's like, because we always used to say, let's eradicate FGM as though it was a virus, as though, like, you know, but it's a really systemic and organized crime that's one of the things is like it's really really organized yeah. and it's about ending fgm 
And that's when, um, so Sophia was born in January 2011, and I started, like, Daughter of Eve in October 2010, because I thought, I'm just going to do it for a few months. So she was your first case study? She was my, she was my first. It was so the, does this involve you arguing with your brother, then? No, because he he was he was like he would never actually had thought about it. But had we not had the conversation, I don't know at the age of seven now, could there be things like, you know, telling him how he should raise her and everything else. And she was also the impetus for me to start talking to my mother. Because about the next some, generation of your family had yeah, arrived. So with, yeah, the first girl. And you to, wanted to, be, to stop the yeah. cycle. And also I wanted to not just like just like end FGM, not by, I, I didn't want her to be physically safe. I wanted her to be contextually safe from the conversation of. Yes thinking of herself as different or as saved, but thinking of herself as someone who... Just herself. Yeah, and somebody who had... Yes, of course. So Otherwise and, it casts a shadow in the opposite direction. Exactly. The one, yeah. like, the, like the girl in Bristol said, you're not special to the girl that hadn't been. Yes. So and I was, I was, yeah, so that was my how my activism um, kind of started. And, and Daughters of Eve goes from strength to strength, although presumably now knowing you rather better than I did before, they're nowhere near fast enough for your liking. No, well, I think what are, so the the the, uh, the global um, like you know aim is to end FGM by 2030, and I think that's a tangible reality. Shut up. Seriously, so honestly, on a on a serious serious note, there's like so I went back home to Somaliland in 2016, and I thought, my God, then like they're gonna hate me. I literally going back to Somaliland, I was walking into that classroom that I walked into in 2006, thinking they're gonna judge me for being too westernized, um, like you know I don't wear a headscarf, but I'm very respect. So, but they were, everybody was like really um, supportive. And yesterday, um, like Somaliland passed the legislation against rape and sexual violence. And now they want to pass the legislation against um, FGM to kind of like, you know, draw a line, uh, like, you know, a line in the sand. And it's my, so it's, it's, it's a country where 98% of the women are cut, but 70% of, um, of the population is under 30. You can actually make that change in a generation. Yes, of course. And that is in and, and Africa where it's most common, where we just keep, keep talking about. It's a very young po um, population and we have the opportunity to really, like, you know, scale up the work that the coalition government did. Um, and by 2020, I think we can have, like, real conversations and then a decade to... You and this... this well, crikey, I mean... Good luck sounds so inadequate, doesn't it, in the context of what... Yeah, but we all have a, play, like a role industry. to play in the sense, yeah. Absolutely, and, and hopefully people now, having listened to you, will have a much, much better, bigger understanding of, of the scale of the problem and the prospect of, of success for yeah. you. And politically, this will be the last line of conversation, You're politically you're fascinating, to me at least, because you are a poster girl for not being binary. The, yeah. the, the sort of footballification of British politics in recent years, where you have to be 100%. If you think Toby Young's a wazzock for the tweets, then you must be a Jeremy Corbyn yeah, yeah, fan. Yeah. There's no room for nuance. You have a genuinely nuanced view of politics based largely on who's proved most helpful to your cause. And also, you know, uh, you know mostly based on the fact that um, I was, uh, like, you know, my life was a result of tribal warfare. Yes. <laughs> and I hate... That probably plays Literally, a part. Literally, it's, it's, it's tr like, you know, it's... And I think that's why my, like, you know, I see a lot of, I used to see a lot of things like very, like, you know, I never see politics very black and white. But you I, have found more, you found a warmer welcome in the Conservative Party than you have in the Labour Party. I get along more, I get along more with Conservatives because of the fact that it's like the bullshit is up front. It's like yeah. I know what I, I know I I know what I'm working with, and I think a lot of um, liberal, like you know, lefty people on, mm. on, um, on the left assume they know things. Yes, of course, and, and the, they assume they know what's best for everybody else. Exactly, and there's never that conversation to be able to kind of delve into things. So, but uh, surely no, even you know, militant is not going to sit here with you and tell you what you don't understand about female genital yeah. nudity. They would do yeah. that. They would, it's like, um, so what was really interesting was that the last podcast I did was um, the News Roast with Julian, um, yeah, with Julian and, and Hayden. And I talked about this dialogue that um, Jeremy Hunt and I had where he asked a very inappropriate question. But it's a question that I've been asked, like, you know, throughout, like, you know, my activism. And it's a very, there's, a, there's a very focus on, like, the sexuality of women yes. post-FGM. And so the question becomes, do you still enjoy, can a woman who's had it enjoy sex? Yeah. yeah. And I just said, like, depends on how good you are in bed, Jeremy, but we're not going to sleep together, senior married, and I'm not really interested. <laughs> but let's just, like... So, and then in that conversation, I ended up talking about how, like, you know, 
the, the Secretary of State asking a former child refugee who's yes. talking about something weird and actively the reason why we know there's 130,000 women in the UK is because he put in the code to kind of ask everybody that comes into really um, as a, a result of yeah, his meeting yeah a you. clinical setting that whether they've had um FGM or um, or, um, or not. And then I talked about in that conversation how I finally have a voice and it's really weird to have a voice yeah. when you're like voiceless as a young person. And then um, without without my say so, first the independent goes crazy with it, going like, you know, how dare he ask this question? And this was four years ago. And then um, Dawn um, Butler writes a letter on my behalf asking him to apologise to me because she's offended that he asked me that question. And I thought, like, literally, no Conservative would ever... Take, be I offended can, on your behalf. On my behalf, they might say to me, "Like, what do you think?" So there is, there's a sense of ownership which I don't like. My, my politics is more. Um, yeah, that's like, interesting. I'm more of a socialist, and I do believe in, like, you know, I don't really care what you do as a job as long as you pay your taxes. Kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say I'm a byproduct of of New Labour, and I'm very comfortable within that kind of um, mm. setting. But um, yeah, the left is. Um, it assumes a lot, and I think what it does is circumstances people's experiences for what they want to for see. For an ideology, yeah. for, a, for a kind of um, slightly naive world, or idealistic. Yeah, and I think the, so. I came, view. I came, and I came back to this country under the Thatcher government. I, like you know, was quite successful under the major governments, and then Tony Blair came in, and I. So I haven't actually known um, the Labour government outside of my, like you know, Cardiff kind of bubble. But so, yeah, it's just, I get along a lot more with Tories. So, I mean, this quote here from you, there is a real possibility that FGM can and will end within our lifetime, and that is thanks to some very white and posh men who saw me and listened. Yeah. I hashtag suspect, not April Fools. Hashtag not April Fools. This is another chapter in that process of very white and posh men listening to you, Nimco. Yeah. Perhaps. No, no, well, I'm not as posh as Zach Goldsmith, who you've also been very... Uh... Do you know what? He he actually is um, one of the most incredible people that, um, that I know. Because he genuinely cares about this he... issue and moved mountains to help you achieve. And he generally, and I don't think um, had it, like, if it's me or whatever, but he generally cares about doing good. And I think mm. what we do is that we... Um, like, you know, alienate people because of who they were. So had, like, had my the civil war not, not happened in um, Somaliland and all these other kind of stuff, yes. I could have been a very out-of-touch, like, you know, kid in Knightsbridge, like, you know, hanging out in the clubs and all this, yeah. like, you know, doing ridiculous things, but I'm not. I'm a very grounded to a certain, um, like, you know, level person, level-headed person. So I don't, like, you know, I don't judge Zach for being rich just as much as I don't rate somebody for being, um, like, you know, politically on the left or all those mm. kind of things. So, yeah, I, like, you know, I'm honoured to call him a friend and, like, I, we we get on. We don't agree on anything. I'm not. I'm not. Sure. A I'm not a Brexiteer. But um, at the same time, I can have that conversation with him and say I don't agree with you on that. And just have kind you, of. Have you read June Sarpong's book? Have no. So I've got a copy of it. You should read it because yeah. I think I think it will resonate with you um, particularly because it's it's essentially the whole. She's a previous yeah. un unfiltered guest, and and it is the whole thesis of her book is that people need to not. I mean, get out of your echo chamber sounds a bit trite, but you need to recognise that people are a multiplicity of opinions and influences and experiences and to think that anybody fits into a pigeonhole yeah. is, is palpably absurd. But I'm not sure I've ever met anyone who defies pigeonholing quite as quite as seriously as you do. Oh, yeah, I think, well, once you see people that look like each other fighting over things that they could really agree on, you end up... And, and that's what and that was what the thing was about standing in for, for the Women's Equality Party yes. um, at the last general election. Um, I could have, like, you know, I could have happily been a, to um, like, you know, a poster child for um, the, the Conservative Party yes. or, like, you know... But the weirdly enough, actually, the, the Labour Party never, like, you know, offered me anything outside of being a councillor. But um, the Conservative Party will probably make me appear, and I don't know. Who knows? Um, what can people do if they want to find out more about the work that you and Daughters of Eve do? Um, so February the 6th is Zero Tolerance Day, so it's the global day that we we kind of like, you know, mark ending FGM yeah. and going towards this um, 2030. So um, I'll be tweeting a lot about that. So just kind of just have a look for Nimco on yeah. Twitter. Um, is it, there's a website presumably for Daughters there, of Eve. There is a website, but the most um, kind of formative thing is just to follow the hashtag and FGM and just okay. kind of see the conversation. Second question: um, Why have there been so few prosecutions in this country? 
because like the fact that nobody was listening to young girls like me, I don't necessarily believe that the law is an ass. What well, it does, it takes into account so like um, so you can be guilty of the like you know, of of doing something. One of the things is that we put that pressure on children. It is not if you make something illegal, it is not my place to decide whether somebody should be arrested or not arrested. Yeah. It's like so there are two prosecutions. Um, going forward at the moment. But the greater thing is that there's been about 160 um, young girls who've been saved from FGM. Who were due to be spirited out of the country? or Taken, taken out of the country or cut here, who okay. like have protection orders. Placed this is a result of your work. Yeah, and, and a lot of the stuff that, the um, weirdly enough, um, a lot of stuff that Theresa May did as Home Secretary, she was really good on the issue. She is a bit interesting in, in the sense that if she cares about something, she's engaged. If she doesn't care about it, just getting her to care, that's the challenge. Oh, well, it's like, it's getting her to do anything is a challenge, but that's... Um, Politics. Uh, that's, that's a different story. What's next yeah. for you? Politics? No. Um, well, I'm political. I don't necessarily want to be a politician, but I do. I do, actually, I, I don't know, as if there is, if there is, uh, um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy about seeing, like, you know, um, James Cleverly as the new um, kind of um, um, vice chair for the Conservative Party. And I think, for me, it would be, um, working with the political parties to really diversify, and obviously, I would, I, I'll have more, I'll have more luck in trying to change the Conservative Party than I would um, trying to um, steer the ship that is the Labour Party at the moment. And that's, oh, I hope they see this and listen to this and, and take I think, on well, board what you've. It's what you've really learned. sad. I, did, I think one of the things that people really misunderstood when I got a lot of the trolling for standing for the for, um, for the Women's Equality Party because you stood against a Labour woman, and the suggestion was that you were letting down the sisterhood or and being anti-feminist. Yeah, or, and it was a weird thing. I was the fact that as though you were entitled it was really because that i was there i was the only young black woman who was on these panels and getting heckled by lefties was really was really um disheartening but what was even more disheartening is that i've never like you know not voted labor outside of the mayoral um, elections i voted for boris and i voted for zach um so make of that as like you know what you I want i think we'll leave it there yeah let, 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 let leave that one hanging Nimco, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm 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 very rarely speechless but that is an, acronym, an absolutely astonishing conversation. Thank you so much for your time.